What's happening, guys? Griffith, um, that hobo who's been uh, making the videos does that self isolate? So I'm gonna stand in for him this week. Uh, what's been happening? So I'm trying to work out when I last made a video. I think it was after Decker's big expose, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And I've had a few days to reflect on it. And uh, obviously, because Decker was taking a few weeks off YouTube, um, apart from the sort of videos he's making every few hours, he has been making much. Jesus Christ, without all that hair. I was struggling to fit into the screen last week. And now there's all this flipping space up here. My hair wasn't that big, was it? Surely. You know, I'm not uh, Marvin Herbert. I didn't have a Marvin Herbert last week, did I? I must have. Anyway, I digress. A few years ago, right? About seven or eight years ago now, I, uh, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. I think it's something I always wanted to do. It's a little known fact that I was at a, a TV program uh, called The Call Centre. It was an ensemble piece that I did, you know, carry it single-handedly. It's generally accepted. And uh, off the back of that program, well, during the filming, uh, they sort of found out, the people filming it, that uh, I told them I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. And... Um, if you dig out series one, episode three, where I made my TV debut, um, I talked to him about that, and I'm actually practicing my stand-up on Swansea Beach, which is just that way. Um, and then I did my debut uh, stand-up, and they filmed it, but it didn't make the program. But I did stand up three times, yeah. You know, first two times it was okay. Third time I had a complete fucking nightmare. What a horrible situation that is, and I thought. Fuck this, this is not for me. But the point, and the reason I'm telling you this, uh, when I was trying to start doing stand-up, I was talking to a mate of mine who had done stand-up for years, and he said to me, he said, uh, one of the most important things when you're doing stand-up comedy, yeah, is that you've got to be likeable. Yeah? If the audience, he said, if the audience like you, you know, they're more likely to find you funny than if you're an unlikable type of person, you know? Which, you know, is obviously very true. Um, I think uh, I think it applies to YouTube as well, you know? You know, I may not come across as the most likable person, you know? Um, I don't smile much, but that's because my teeth are fucked, if I'm honest, rather than uh, I got a problem with smiling. But yeah, he said, you know, you've got to be likeable um, to be a good stand-up comedian. And do you know what I've noticed in this podcast wars? Because I've, you know, every every single time I've recorded one of these, I've been like, I got no favourites and blah, blah, blah. And no, don't judge innocent and proven guilty. But you know one thing that's become really obvious to me? Uh, more than it was before over the last week is Decker Heggy is not very likeable, is he? You know, regardless of whether you believe he's done these things he's been accused of or you don't believe it, you know, because I still don't really know what to think. You know, if I was going to have a bet on it, I'm not, a, I'm not a bet. Well, I was going to say I'm not a betting man. I do bet on football, but I never win. So I suppose I'm not a betting man, I'm a losing man. I'm not a fighting man or a betting man. I'm a losing man and a Welsh man. But, um, yeah, if I had to have a bet on it, I think I know what I bet on. But it doesn't mean I know that's what I'd probably lose. So, uh, so yeah, maybe. No, <laughs> I won't even say that. So, yeah, anyway, so I know what I think, but I don't know, so I don't say, yeah. Um, as I've said, you know, if he's guilty of what he's accused of, fucking awful. If he's innocent of what he's been accused of, then it's fucking awful, you know, what's, what he's been through, you know. But either way, wherever the truth transpires to be, he's just not coming across as very likeable this week. Um, 
like you know this fight is on in march now apparently at a big venue two grand for a ringside table thousand pound for another table so you're talking about you know for your, your average punter 50 to 100 quid to go and watch this fight um i suggested in a previous video 9.99 pay-per-view with three fights you know with darren g fighting english and uh there was another one when uh, I don't know, living in London, fighting Liam Ditchie, perhaps. I can't remember. For nine ninety nine, I'd probably pay for the three fights, but you know, I wouldn't be entertaining hundred pound. Um, yeah, but anyway, point being that uh, Danny Christie has said, "I'm not going to fight you in that environment." You know, Decker now apparently the tickets are on sale. You know. And he was making a video where, you know, you don't have to be flipping Petrocelli to work this out. But you could see he was saying, there's other people um, who have, you know, put a lot of work in now to put these fights on and you agreed to it, so you have to do it now. And you know what he's doing there. And he's saying, right, you know my mates by her now. They're fucking, they're the proper fucking odd cunts. They're the proper crazy cunts. You don't want to fuck with them. He's realised that Danny Christie's not afraid of him. So he's trying to make him afraid of other people, you know? And, uh, you know, I think, I think what's really happened, you know, regardless of the expose and all that side of things, I think what they've realised, what Decker has realised is, Fucking hell, man. I could have made fucking £250,000 out of that fight the other day. I was looking somewhere earlier. Maybe not on Decker's uh, Facebook page. But I think it had like a couple of million views. Just there. You know, and all the other pages it's on. 80,000 on YouTube on one channel. And, you know, it's probably had 5, 10 million views. And, uh... I remember when that, that week, the build-up to all that, and it was very exciting at the time, wasn't it? As weird as that sounds. And I remember thinking, like, the day the fight was going to be on, it was like, you know, I was still thinking, oh, this ain't going to happen. You know, this this isn't really going to happen. People are always talking about fighting on YouTube and they never have fights. And when it all kicked off, and then it was a fucking proper pack of on it, you know, right old square go. I remember thinking, man, I would have happily paid a fiver, you know, to watch that on pay-per-view. There'd have been some sort of paywall. Um, and I think Dak has realised, oh, for fuck's sake, we've had this fight. It's fucking been amazing. <clears throat> and we have made fuck all out of it. So we're going to have to do it again. And, uh, and after the fight, you know, he'd said, all right, we don't talk about each other anymore. And, you know, I think possibly Dagger realised that uh, Danny Christie was such a massive part of the expose. It was like, uh, well, we have to talk about each other, really, because, you know, it was only that clown emoji, wasn't it, that uh, opened the gates for Dagger to bring him back into his life. So, you know, Christie's like, ah, he's making these videos now, and he, the last few days, saying, so, look, I'll, I'll fight you in my fucking garden, but I'm not. I'm not fighting you in some fucking arena with making you a load of money. And Dak is like, yeah, no, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. You're fighting me. And if you don't, mm -hmm. you know what will happen. You know what will happen. And, um, yeah, it's just not coming across very likeable. <clears throat> you know, I've, um... i got a few mates, like, you know, proper fucking hard men, do you know what I mean? And uh, and Danny Christie reminds me a bit of some of them, you know, or got similar traits to some of them. But none of my sort of hard men mates remind me of, of Decker, you know. You can see sometimes that, uh, you know, he's not dull. He says he's not dull, and he's not. He's quite clever. He's quite sort of succinct and... You know, and you can see he's a good talker. But you can also see there's been quite a few instances where if that talking doesn't get the desired effect, 
you can see that little switch in it and it's like all right then well if you're not going to listen to me talking i'm just gonna to use one of his phrases knock 10 bells of shit out of you i think he says you know you can see it's that sort of environment in it where if he's the artist in the room then what he says goes whether it's right or wrong he's probably lived a lot of his life like that and it he's probably spent the majority of his life being the artist in the room and uh and used that you know to get his own way but now he's sort of moving into sort of uh situations where he's not necessarily the artist in the room anymore um and he doesn't like it you know what I thought with that expose, right? Remember at the end when he was on about the acro? Do you know what I thought, right? It was all building up and I thought he was going to go, I've done the acro. These are the things that are on it. These are the, there's nothing on it about kids. And there's three women who accused me of uh, rape. And here's the first woman. And then it will cut to a woman or a letter or the text of each one of them explaining oh look my head was fucked at the time do you know what I mean blah 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 or somebody saying oh so and so fucking got me to do it you know they gave me X amount of money to ring the police or you know I thought he was going to break down each situation in such a way where you'd think fucking hell man he's just had a bit of bad you know, I I haven't had the best luck with women, do you know what I mean? Um, well, I'm single, so basically, you know, my success rate of relationships is currently operating around about the 0% mark. But, um, yeah, but to have three women turn around and go, oh, he's done this. Long odds, long odds there. Um, but I thought, you know, maybe he would be able to explain it, you know. I thought he, well, I don't know how he would. But I thought he was going to, anyway. I thought that expose, what I was expecting, maybe not by the time that it actually came out, because there's lots of other stuff that had come out, and I'd see, as I said, I'd seen most of it already, but... <clears throat> a few weeks before he started, sort of drip feed at the expose, and I was still, oh, I don't know what to think, really. I thought he was going to, uh, the expose was going to come out and I was going to be, fucking hell, man. These people have fucking tried to do him up like a right old kipper. You know, and I thought that would be the end of that. I thought, right, well, at least I know now that he hasn't done all that. It's just a case then of wondering why these people have gone to such lengths to, uh, to make people think think that he had I just come out about expose thinking well he just had three hours to sort of explain well not to explain to prove your innocence and I know he shouldn't have to if he is innocent but in the circumstances you know he's a podcaster he's a public figure as I say he's an actor writer a fighting man um, you know the situation has become that he does have to Prove his innocence, basically, doesn't he? You know, if he wants to quiet life or whatever, or to continue to go from strength to strength in the uh, podcast show game. He's the only one who calls them podcast shows, isn't he? Um, but yeah, the expose left me thinking six months none the richer. I thought, right, well, you've just spent three hours explaining uh, how you're completely innocent. And I still don't know if you are, you know? Very strange business, isn't it? Very strange business. As I've touched on in the past, and it? it's when... Uh, it's like all this sort of gangster sort of stuff, yeah. This is supposed to go on in a separate part of society. Do you know what I mean? That's the way that it operates, yeah. Can you imagine like five of the top fucking boys in the various county lines outfit uh, 
<laughs> currently being engaged in a sort of YouTube or of who's got the best gear about who runs different parts of the country and they're all publicly arguing you know they keep a low profile don't they I know with the sort of drill music and all that I think people do sort of make YouTube videos saying yeah I shot Billy T last week and uh, don't come to NW3 Billy T you're gonna get shot again in your knee and all that business so I know the sort of drill sort of side of thing, they go all public, don't they, about their beefs and everything, but, you know, proper gangsters, criminals, drug dealers, whatever, the fucking last thing they want to do is going all public on you, isn't it? Having fucking idiots like me talking about it. They want to go under the radar, don't they? So it's very weird that... Uh, that has come to this. Very, very... <clears throat> sorry, my voice went, my voice broke again. It's uh, very weird it's come to this. And, you know, I'm trying to work out why. You know, I understand that... Uh, I'm sort of repeating myself from previous videos, but most people have switched off by now, so I just... got a bit of free reign just to chat to myself, really. Um... You know, it probably does stem back to a cross, not a cross, but a mix of Joe Rogan, uh, lockdown, and uh, human nature. You know, I remember a few years ago, when I first got into Rogan, I don't know when, maybe five years ago or whatever, but he'd have like these three-hour long chats, yeah, you know, with people and no hurry. and You get the right guest on, it'd be brilliant, do you know what I mean? And then I think it started then, all this nonsense. It was probably going on anyway, you know, less publicly. There were probably a few people, like, I don't know, James English probably thought for years, oh, I'm going to be the dawn of this game. In the UK, he said, and he's going to be the biggest in the world and all that crap, do you know what I mean? But I think when Darren G uh, went on, or even before that, remember when David Icke was on... Um, what was that fucking weird guy who ran for mayor in London? <coughs> American guy. Fuck, what was his name? Oh, that was something about London, wasn't it? Not living in London. Oh, bear with me. Fast forward this bit, because it's just thinking time. London Real. Yeah, I can't remember his name, but the guy who had that, he was doing London Real. And he was doing podcasts and he looked like he was going to end up being one of the top boys. And then he got fucking carried away with himself and tried making money year there and everywhere. But I remember he had David Icke on talking about the old, uh, what's the words we're allowed to use on you without getting picked up by a bot. Talking about the old COVID and the old, uh, the old, the old, uh, the old guh, you know. The old, not the, uh, not L5, Danny G, the, uh, Darren, not Danny, yeah, the old Danny, Darren as well, but the old F guy, and, uh, Ike was talking about that on London Real, and he was on a couple of times, I remember once, it was like on a Sunday, and it was in the middle of lockdown, just at the start, so it wasn't the middle, it was the beginning-ish. And it was like fucking hundreds of thousands of people watching the live. And then, and then this London Real guy, fuck, what was that idiot's name? He was, um, he wanted donations to set up his own platform and this and that, and he had like a fucking million pound donated, I think, something weird like that. And he never really did anything and then I got kicked off YouTube and then uh, London Real was running for mayor all of a sudden and then he sort of disappeared so it was obviously idiots thinking they could run things a long time ago um, but I'm sure people would have looked at that and thought hang on there's two people talking on YouTube here on a Sunday flipping morning 
on Sunday afternoon. And it's like half a million people watching it. And then like Songs of Praise would have been on six o'clock at night and there was probably like 30,000 people. You know, that's what's happened now. There's more people watch YouTube and all that than watch TV, you know. I sometimes go to look for like music and I think, oh, it's a song I haven't heard for a while. I'll search for it on YouTube. It's got like 72 million views. So what the fuck's that all about? And ask someone like fucking Nick Kershaw. Wouldn't it be good? <laughs> or the Thompson Twins. Or Colonel Abraham's Trapped. <clears throat> but yeah. Um, 72 million views for a song on YouTube. And like, you know, EastEnders when Dirty Dan flipping presented uh, Angie with the divorce papers. That was the most watched thing ever on British TV. What did I have? 32 million? You know what I mean? So the numbers, yeah, anyway, have gone all over the place with this. And I, but I think probably people like London Real, you know, so right, Joe Rogan, he's got it sussed. Does it on his own terms. Without, without you know, we're failing to realise that Joe Rogan has been like... Uh, and he's not everybody's favourite comedian, you know, he's not a great stand-up. And he can be a bit of a sort of, uh, a bit of a nelly know it all, can he? But he's good though, he's just positive and he's he promotes his thing, doesn't he? So yeah, so he had like, you know, 20 years experience of doing stand-up, he'd been an actor, he'd been involved with the UFC for years, he'd been into his jiu-jitsu for years, his training. You know, he had a lot of uh, a lot of things going on under his umbrella, you know. So he was able to chat to lots of different types of people. And he's very intelligent as well. So, you know, being a sort of stand-up comedian like myself, uh, he was able to think quickly, you know, able to... And he's a good listener as well, which is... Uh, I'll say that for James English. Out of all of the... And it's the, re the reason, right, I can't watch old flipping <whistles> old Big Marv. I can't watch him because he, he can't listen to people. And he, he can have the better, I think he had Tama Hassan on, you know, brilliant actor. I like him, cool as fuck, isn't he? I thought, I'll watch that. I couldn't watch it because it was just like, Marv kept interrupting, do you know what I mean? And, uh, Yeah, that's the one good thing about James English, you know, it's why, like, he had this thing Sunday morning when at 10 o'clock, he sort of used to bring his things out. And sometimes he dropped little, little trailers through the week, right, Sunday morning, I'm talking to this guy. And uh, I'd get up on Sunday morning, my daughter would be here, she'd be watching TV or whatever. And i think, bang, get the headphones in. And, uh, you know, while I'm preparing the veg for Sunday dinner and uh, doing the gardening, and uh, cleaning the drains and stuff, and uh, yeah, and and uh, washing the school uniforms, and uh, well, so I'm not gonna pretend I was doing. I'd listen to James English, do you know what I mean? And think, oh, wicked. Still listen to him now. But I think a lot of people. Uh, sorry, I've just. I've uh, I've not really sort of plotted this one through. Yeah, he's a great listener. I just saw a lot of people, saw Joe Rogan, saw the numbers that London Real were getting. James English and Atwood were doing their thing. True Geordie, you know, and they were pulling in some stupid numbers. And then a lot of the guests, starting with Darren G, as may not have started, but as I remember it, Darren G goes on, pulls millions of views. Billy, um, Billy Moore, I looked the other day, actually, when Billy Moore was on True Geordie. I think he's had a couple of times, but one of them had, like, two million views. So Billy Moore probably thought, you know what, I could do that. Marv, then he went on, didn't he, on... Uh, I'm not sure where he went first, maybe James English, or maybe on Vice. Well, I think I seen him on Vice. Because when Marv first came along, I thought, man, this guy's fucking nuts. Like, you know, and a really interesting story, you know, if you're into this sort of fucking nonsense... <clears throat> Marv's story was fucking out there, same as Darren G's, isn't it? 
and uh, and then they thought, all oh, right, well, all these views are coming in because of me. So I could get those same, same views. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you can get a million views because of your story, but what have you got after that, in it? What have you got after that? You know, and um, everybody seems to slag him off, but I think Darren G's all right, man. I don't know the history. Well, you know, only what I've heard on you. You know, the fact that he's sort of vowed to bring down all the fucking gangsters, the drug dealers in Merseyside, is probably not a wise thing to say, isn't it? Especially when you spend half your life doing it yourself. But, you know, he says he's saying it for all the right reasons, isn't it? But it don't really work like that in that game, you know? I think if you've been a drug dealer or if, you know, if you've got your own demons, you've caused your own issues, uh, created your own problems to society, and, you know, and you want to pay society back, then, you know, then you go about it and do it, do what you want to do. You can't turn around to people still doing it and go, right, I've sort of made out now, so the whole fucking world needs to sort their heads out, you know, because we're all operating at different time scales, you know. It's a bit like when people uh, stop drinking and that, you know, they stop drinking and then they go around telling everybody else, oh, you need to stop drinking, you're alcoholic, you're alcoholic, or oh, you're alcoholic, you know. It's, it don't work like that. Some people can still enjoy drinking and some people can't, but who the fuck are you to tell me to stop? Do you know what I mean? I haven't, uh, I haven't reached that point myself. So yeah, so it was never going to work. Was it going to war with the sort of, uh, the entire Merseyside sort of uh, drug dealing community? Never going to be wise. That's probably why he's, you know, hated talk of him being a grass or whatever I don't particularly know much about that but watching his lives you know he has got sort of uh, something about him do you know what I mean he could just go on a rant for like half an hour you know and you could tell it's just coming straight from from the heart or the head or, or whatever and he means what he says whereas other people are more contrived you know, it's more like uh, semi-scripted, if you like. So, yeah, so everybody seems to hate him. And he's like, oh, look, I don't give a fuck, man. He was talking this week about some of the stuff he's going through with his kid and all that, you know. And I'm sure there's a lot of blokes. Well, uh, parents, mainly blokes, who can relate to the uh, parental alienation fucking problems that a lot of people have to go through at certain times, you know. And uh, and if you've ever been through it, it is grim, isn't it? You know, having a lot of hassle to see your own child, it's like, yeah, that's not what I signed up for. So he's obviously got a lot on his plate. I actually sent him a fiver today because it's his birthday. So yeah, so I like him. I've been enjoying Uncle, uh, Uncle Kay's lives since he's broken away from the snake pit. Uh, I still like watching the snake pit more, more for the madness, I think. But it's nice to have the alternative of a relatively sane Uncle Kay's place. Um, I like Paul the snake pit. He's just fucking mad, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? He can be frustrating sometimes. But I think he's got like ADHD or something. I, I'm, I think he has got some sort of syndrome like that because... He's trying to do ten things at once. I was watching him about half hour ago and there was a guy on... Dougie Joyce's manager, I think, who I think is a bit of a hard fucker. And he was giving him, like, really good advice, you know, about where you're going to go with your channel and what's your plans and blah, 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 you know. And Paul's, like, on his phone and fucking putting stuff up and blah, blah, blah. And it was like, listen to this guy, man. Do you know what I mean? But he just couldn't. Literally couldn't. I don't think it was because he was being rude and I said, I just think he just could not fucking sit still. Well, he was sitting still, but you know what I mean? Um, but he brings the numbers in every night and he's grown something out of nothing and he has got a community there and, you know, and it's quite mad. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, I like watching him. I like him. I like watching Uncle Kay. Uh, 
like James English, you know, like watching him if he's got a good guest on. Don't particularly agree with a lot of, uh, you know, what these people do behind the fucking scenes that is uh, seeping out for the rest of us to see. I think all that side of it, we don't know the fucking half of it, you know, so there's a lot of them. We got there. Right, this is my to camera persona. And then the camera goes off and they're like a completely different person. Which brings us back to Mr. Heggy. I'm sure there's a lot of that with him. You know, he says he's an actor, and he? So I think a lot of time is a bit of acting, really. And uh, it's like tactics, isn't it? You know, I've, those calls that have been leaked of him and Swanson chatting away about, right, how can we bring him down? And how can we, it's like, just do your own shit, isn't it? If your own stuff's good. Do you really think Joe Rogan... When his channel was growing, he was worrying about other podcasters. And it's like, right, we need to fuck him up because he's taking 20,000 of my viewers. And we need to fuck him up. You know? That's why I'm happy gliding along quietly myself. Up to about 170 subs now. Mate of mine's got a YouTube channel, right? He's been doing it for years. Talks about all sorts of politics. and You know, he's... Uh, don't go into what he talks about of all sorts. And uh, he said he had quite a well-known YouTuber on his channel once. He was interviewing him. And on, on the back of that interview, he had an extra 2,000 subscribers within a couple of days. And the, the big-time YouTube guy, my mate was saying to him, Oh, man, nice one. I got fucking an extra 2,000 subs because you come on my channel. And the big time YouTube guy said to him, yeah, they're your problem now. And then suddenly he had an extra 2,000 subscribers. Fucking couple of hundred of them would be fucking slagging him off all the time in the comments and blah, blah, blah. You know, I think practically every comment, apart from a handful that I've seen on my videos, have been, you know, nice or constructive or interesting or relevant to what I'm talking about. You know, and I thank you for that, guys. You know, I've only got my hair cut because Charlie Kenwright said to me, uh, have you been brushing your hair with a toffee apple? And there's quite a few people, you know, regular names cropping up, and I see them around the place in chats and in comment sections. So there's quite a lot of uh, regulars. And it's nice, you know. I don't want to make a video and have 20 people right underneath, oh, what are you on about, you fucking stupid, ugly, dopey-looking cunt? It's like, oh, cheers, mate, you know. I'm too sensitive for all that. Um, yeah, when I was on that TV programme, uh, it was an ensemble piece, but I carried it single-handedly. <clears throat> if you go on Twitter, search hashtag, hashtag Griff, hashtag the call centre, or both together, most of the comments were, like, favourable. It was like, oh, funny you are. Or, oh, yeah, you said the things in work that I would have said. And, you know, I think, uh, I'd probably say, and I'm not just saying it, it's just the fucking simple maths of it. I'd say about 98% of the comments were, you know, pleasant or whatever. And 2% were, oh, you fucking scruffy cunt, fucking blah, blah, blah. And those 2% were like, oh, God, do you know what I mean? A fucking far more impact than the, the people going, oh, how great you are. And I'd be like, yeah, but you don't actually know me. I'm a fucking idiot. The ones who were going, oh, you're a fucking idiot. I'd be like, oh, shit, I know. And then it was like two against one then, wasn't it? So, yeah, so uh, it's nice to quietly chug along, isn't it? Quietly chug along. Anyway, I thought I'd do it a bit different this week, you know, because I'm a very, very intelligent podcaster. So I thought what I would do is have a good old chat this week. Don't worry about the time. Don't worry about views, and clicks or whatever. And, uh, and the people who enjoy listening to my crap will probably watch it. And those who don't won't. Um, you know, and that's all I'm here for, really. You know, keep myself amused, and that. 
you know, something to do. Uh, you know, keep a little bit of hope. Because, yeah, my other channel, Griff Slowly Dollar Lectures, that was the plan, actually, with that channel at the time. About five, six years ago I started that. My plan was to find... Because I'd like gone through a bit of a relationship breakup and my fucking head was mashed and I had, uh, had addiction issues and all that fucking nonsense and uh, my plan was to find uh, a thousand lonely people and uh, and put us all together. So hence the name Griff's Lonely Dollar Lectures. And then what I wanted to do then with those thousand lonely people is charge them like a fiver a month. And then uh, get off YouTube or whatever, just go somewhere private where we could all have a little community, you know, where I'm like the sort of uh, the governor, as they call it. And like, yeah, make five grand a month, uh, you know, providing a service and building a community. Uh, and then all these sort of lonely people, we could all help each other out and, uh, you know, and then not be lonely and help each other to rebuild our lives, you know. And then plus then, that would have been my job. You know what I mean? I'd have been sitting here, yapping away, helping, you know. Could be your best friend, you know, your worst enemy. You know, some people need armour on the shoulder, some need to kick up the ass. All that business. And, uh... Yeah, you know, really do something good, you know, build a community of people who need each other, because as we're seeing now in these unprecedented times, community is everything. The thing I'm most proud of this year is building a, a community down at the foot golf. I'm watching that th thrive, thrive. Ah, uh, yeah, oh, and I made a film. It's called Foot Golf's Coming Home. That was the whole reason I started this channel. So if you want to watch my film, it's on this channel. Just search Fuck Golf's Coming Home, the movie. Uh, if you're not into Fuck Golf, I'll give you a little taste of what it's about. Crack, what, what, what a film. What a, I won't spoil the ending, right? But we set around a tournament. We had our first ever tournament in Swansea, the Swansea Open. And... Uh, yeah, and it's based around what happened there. Um, you wouldn't believe how far the sports come in Swansea and in Wales in the last nine months, but that's for another time. So, yeah, what was the point of all this? Bang, on fucking, fuck it all, 30 minutes, 30 something. <coughs> um, so, yeah, see, so still lonely. Um... Yeah, so Decker doesn't seem very likeable to me. Um, still none the wiser, really, of what uh, what the truth is in any of all this caper. Don't think he's doing himself any favours either way. I like Danny Christie. He seems like a proper, like, honest fucking bloke. You know, and... It's like somebody, maybe in Karma, Karma Corner, big up Karma Corner. But somebody pointed out the other day that we've all got shit in our past we're ashamed of. I mean, we all have. And like in the expose, he's like, oh, yeah, but he's done this. Oh, yeah, don't listen to him. He's done that. Meanwhile, Deck is like, oh, but I've never done anything wrong. You know, I'm fucking great, I am. Don't listen to all these because they fucking... And then he'd use their past misdemeanors against against them, whilst making out he'd never done anything wrong in his life. And if even if he hasn't done the things he's accused of, you know, like the way he talked about that Geraldine woman, that was sick as fuck, really, wasn't it? In a big expose, after all these years, he's still like, yeah, willing to humiliate somebody who's obviously a bit vulnerable. Um.
Show me a man, right, who says they've never choked their own mother out. And I'll show you a liar. Yeah. No one's innocent around here. Anyway, thanks for listening, guys. See you next time. All the best. Very chest.